Welcome to IVF This, episode 38, Emotional Adulthood. Welcome to IVF This. I'm your host, Emily Ginn. I'm a mother to two beautiful and feral boys. I'm married to my favorite person in the world. I'm a social worker, a life coach, and an IVF warrior. I'm here to teach you how to manage your mind and emotions during your IVF journey, to break free from anxiety and regain control of your life, even in the midst of infertility. I'm going to teach you to say IVF this to how we think about, talk about, and experience infertility. Let's go. Hello, my beautiful friends, and welcome back to the podcast. I am loving today's topic because it's kind of the culmination of several podcast episodes that I've done over the past few months, kind of bringing it all of those ideas together. First, I want a little update on our last IVF round. Yesterday, the day that I'm recording, we had our frozen embryo transfer. Because of the way I write and record these, by the time this episode is released, we will already know the fate of that transfer. Like, any of us that have experienced a two-week wait, and I'm not just exclusively talking about IVF or fertility treatments because I think it's a pretty universal experience when we're trying to conceive for a while, your brain goes through these intense mental gymnastics. And come to think of it, this would be true for any major thing in your life, right? New house, especially in this ridiculous market, a new job, marriage, literally any major life event. Our brains go into overdrive. All the scenarios, all of the heartbreak, all of the happiness, all of us, even you coach. As I'm writing this, we are now 24 hours-ish into the wait. My brain goes back and forth from it didn't work to there's no way for us to know that yet to I didn't do XYZ right to I've done everything I've known to I've done everything I know to do to be ready and able to welcome and carry this baby. It's totally normal. I've been working on the thought she's exactly where she is supposed to be, and I know exactly how to take care of her. This is the thought that I continue to come back to, redirecting my brain from the constant barrage of, you didn't do this, you didn't do that. I remind my brain, I know why you think that. You're trying to protect me from a perceived or potential pain. But I choose, right, and this is something that I really reinforce with my clients, I choose to not feel that pain ahead of time, which is what happens when we indulge in those, you didn't do this right, it's not going to work, things like that. I remind myself that I am safe and again, that she is where she is supposed to be and I know how to take care of her. The reason I wanted to share this with you all is because I want you to see that just because I'm a coach and coach on this stuff all day long doesn't mean that my brain isn't wired any differently than yours. Our brains are wired the same. I don't have to get rid of these thoughts. I know that they're going to come. I've just trained myself to recognize when their bullshittery is afoot and remind my brain, oh no, love, we don't do that here. We don't talk to ourselves like that anymore. And then build thoughts that I want to intentionally think. Now, it doesn't work 100% of the time. In fact, I would say it probably only works about 30 to 50% of the time. Sometimes I don't catch the BS. Sometimes I see it and still lean into it because it's not about perfection. It's about intention. Imagine what your relationship with yourself would be like with 50% less self-loathing. Imagine how you would feel with 50% less anxiety. Imagine what you could accomplish with 50% less perfectionistic fantasies. The possibilities are endless, my friends. So if you want some help with that, a mini session with me, you can book either through my website, www.ivfthiscoaching.com or in my social media links at IVF This Coaching. It's 30 minutes, completely complimentary. It's there for you whether you want to continue the conversation of working together or not. It's my gift to you. Okay, so today we're going to talk about the concept of emotional adulthood. This concept was developed by one of my coaches, Brooke Castillo of the Life Coach School. She was the person that I found when I first found coaching. I was trained using the same coaching model that she developed, 
And this is one of her primary concepts that she developed as the backbone of her work. The reason I wanted to talk about it today is because it's kind of tying together the basis of a couple of previous episodes, feeling triggered and toxic people. So I'm going to explain what emotional childhood is and then what emotional adulthood is. Emotional childhood is when we do not take responsibility for how we feel. It's really that simple. Understanding that we are responsible for how we feel in every moment is one of the primary tenets of my coaching. We are in charge of our thoughts and we are in charge of our feelings because our thoughts create our feelings. When we are functioning in emotional childhood, we are blaming people for how we think, feel, and act. I do want to make sure it's known that this is incredibly normal. Like, this isn't a jab at anyone. No one takes us to emotional adulthood college. No one teaches us about our thoughts and our feelings. We learn math, science, reading, and writing. But yet when it comes to all of the things that happen in our brain, we're kind of left to our own devices. So we believe what we are told and what we are modeled. No one takes us by the hand like, well... Now that you're an adult, let me tell you how to take responsibility for your thoughts and feelings and how it's the most empowering thing that you can do for yourself and your mental health. No. In fact, the pseudo-empowerment movement, it's funny that I heard another coach call it diet self-help, which I thought was hilarious, and I think it's very appropriate. Anyway, the movement continues to perpetuate emotional childhood with terms like toxic and the hustle mentality that generally leave us feeling defeated because we can't be perfect. When we're children, we don't have the capacity to think in conceptualized terms. That's because our prefrontal cortex, the part of our brain that is responsible for executive functioning, is not even completely formed until we're 21. Your prefrontal cortex is vital for this emotional adulthood concept because it is your logic brain. When we're kiddos, we think that everything that's going on in our lives is what causes our feelings. And this is perpetuated when something happens and a teacher or a parent is saying, now you hurt this person's feelings, you need to say sorry for hurting her. Or when you did that, that was really mean and it makes me feel this way. This is what I meant when I said, Since we're not taught this stuff, we model what is modeled to us. This is a perfect example of how we modeled what was modeled. It's so deeply ingrained in our society and culture that we don't even realize that we are continuously teaching and reinforcing this to ourselves, our peers, and our children. It's a very disempowering thing that we do to ourselves and other people. Children don't have the capacity to understand that there is a distinction. And won't really until their early adulthood. And there are so many adults functioning in everyday life in emotional childhood. We, as a society, keep ourselves in that place of emotional childhood. We blame the government. We blame the economy. We blame our bosses. We blame other people. We blame infertility. We blame our partners, our ex-partners. We blame our parents, our siblings, and our childhood. Emotional adulthood is when we decide to take full responsibility for everything we think and feel no matter what. No matter what someone else does or doesn't do. Now, I'm not suggesting that this is easy by any stretch of the imagination. It's a challenge for all of us. I still struggle with this with my kids and my husband. Often, I want to give them credit for my frustration, my anger, my resentment, or whatever thought or feeling I'm having but it's not theirs. It's mine. Now, I know some of you might be brimming with, but what if questions. Here's the thing. The circumstances of our lives, the things that happen to us and around us, the things that we don't have any control over, those that are opportunities for us to have a thought and a feeling about. But the circumstances never create our thoughts and feelings. Circumstances are always neutral. It's math. There's no drama or flair with circumstances. My coach instructor used to describe it as this. If there is a fly on the wall, what would the fly see or hear? And that's what you use for a circumstance. The reason that I know that a circumstance cannot create a thought is because that thought is entirely dependent on the person or individual. One of my favorite examples of this that I often share with my clients is the circumstance of a negative pregnancy test. 
We know that that is a circumstance because the pregnancy test is negative. Other people can see it. Other people would agree. Yep, that's a negative pregnancy test. Now, for one person, this news might be completely devastating, like for many of us. But for another person, this might be the best news that they've heard in a while. Not being pregnant was the goal for this person. So they're actually feeling very relieved. So it can't actually be the negative pregnancy test that created thoughts and feelings. It was that person, their preferences, their beliefs, their thoughts, their expectations. One of the primary reasons that I want to bring this up and sell you guys on this idea of emotional adulthood is because so many of my clients come to me thinking and feeling, consciously or subconsciously, that they are victims. Now, I know that that's a pretty blanket term and not all of us would like to use that word to describe ourselves. In fact, it might be a little triggering for me to say that. But there are a lot of ways that the victim mentality comes through. And I'll be completely honest, so many of these things, probably all of them, I have felt or thought myself. Here's a few, just to give you an example. You're blaming other people or situations for how you feel. You feel like God, life, or other people are against you. Cynicism and pessimism. You spend a lot of time catastrophizing. You think people are intentionally trying to hurt you or upset you. You believe that you are the only one experiencing this quote-unquote mistreatment. You relive painful past memories that made you feel helpless. You refuse to consider other people's perspectives when you're talking about things that upset you. You feel powerless and unable to cope with a problem or life in general. You feel attacked or defeated when you're given constructive criticism. You believe that the world is mostly a bad or sad place. When something happens to you, you relive it over and over and over with other people in your life. You expect to gain sympathy from others, and when you don't get it, you feel upset. You're constantly putting yourself down. These are examples of emotional childhood, which is a reframing of victimhood. In these scenarios, and this isn't an exhaustive list by any means, think about how much power we give to other people in situations, how much authority other people in situations have over us. Emotional childhood can look like us having a temper tantrum and rage fits and yelling and screaming at each other. It puts us in a place where we don't feel like we have control over ourselves as adults, and we therefore start acting seriously like toddlers sometimes. I've done this many times in my own life. I catch myself acting like a whining, screaming little girl because I'm not taking responsibility. And I'm yelling at someone, blaming them for how I feel instead of truly taking responsibility for every emotion that I have. When we are in emotional adulthood, we are taking responsibility for how we think and feel and the choices that we make. You will end up feeling so much more empowered and you get to be the person you want to be instead of being in this default emotional space that is reliant on everybody else. This is how I really learned and understood emotional childhood. Let's say I give my emotional life over to my husband and I tell him, you are responsible for making me happy. Or you're responsible for when I'm frustrated and you're responsible for when I'm sad and you're responsible and everything you do causes an emotion in me. You can see how when I'm in that space, that I'm going to be constantly trying to control him. I'm going to be constantly trying to tell him what to do and how to do it. And I'm going to be mad when he doesn't do it. And my emotions are going to be all over the place because I'm trying to control his actions because he's like a pawn in my emotional chessboard. Whatever he does is going to determine how I feel. This is a very disempowering place to be, and it's maddening because you can't control other people. In fact, I've noticed that they don't really like it when you try. If I'm going to go to my husband and I say, here are my needs and you need to meet them, it's almost like I'm a little bit dependent. Because if I'm dependent on him to meet those needs so that I get to feel a certain way, My needs are that you do this and this and this and this in order for me to be happy. If he in turn tells me what his needs are for me to give him happiness, me to make him happy, then we've put each other's happiness in each other's hands. 
And that's not really a good place to be because most people can't even make themselves happy, let alone try to make anyone else happy. Most people don't want to spend all of their time and energy trying to make you happy because they're trying to manage their own emotional life. So delegating that responsibility to even someone that you love can affect that relationship in a very deep and painful way. I like to say that the best relationships are when two people come together and say, I'm going to meet my own needs, you meet your needs, and then we can come together and have a really good time. My expectations of you are not to manage my emotional life because I'm having a hard time doing that myself. I don't know how I could expect you to do it. I want to make a caveat here real quick. You can always make requests of people. I'm not saying don't ever have a request of your children or don't ever have a request of your partner. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is when you make a request of someone and if they don't meet that need or that expectation, then you experience a whole lot of pain and suffering. People aren't required or obligated to meet your expectations or requests. That is your expectation. That is your request. I was explaining this concept to a client and she asked me, well, if you're only responsible for how you feel, don't you think you're abdicating responsibility for how you treat other people? Which I love this question, but I think it's actually the opposite of truth. I think that when you're acting from a place of emotional adulthood, you don't act in a way that is mean or spiteful or petty. Those actions come from a place of emotional childhood. Usually when you're being mean or petty or passive aggressive, it's because you're trying to control the person. You're trying to get them to behave in a certain way so you will get to feel better, which generally only leads to tension or frustration in the relationship. Emotional adulthood says, look, you get to behave however you want and I get to behave however I want and I'm responsible for all of the things on my side. I'm kind of picturing the scene from Dirty Dancing. This is my dance space. This is your dance space. That's what emotional adulthood looks like and apparently professional dancing. The last thing I want to add, and it's just as important as the other things I talked about, but it's when you are learning this process and you are starting to take responsibility for your thoughts and feelings, the point is not to then start blaming yourself for any thoughts or feelings or actions that you take and don't like. A lot of us go from blaming other people and then we turn that blame on ourselves. Blame serves no purpose in relationships. I guess it serves a purpose, but more pain and suffering, but it doesn't serve a useful or productive purpose in relationships. And that includes the relationship with yourself. Blame is judgment. The opposite of judgment is always, always, always curiosity. I wonder why I'm thinking this. I wonder what I'm thinking that's creating this feeling of X, Y, Z. I wonder how I could look at this situation differently. Is this actually how I want to think or feel? There are many times throughout our infertility journey that we will choose to feel sadness, grief, anger, or any other painful or uncomfortable emotion. And that's a beautiful thing. The point is to choose it intentionally. Eyes wide open and taking full responsibility for it. It is an enormously liberating gift to give yourself, my friends. And it's a gift that I want each of you to experience. And that is what I have for you today. I will talk to you soon. Have a beautiful week. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of IVF This. If you like what you've heard, click subscribe and follow to make sure you don't miss an episode. And if you want to learn more, head over to www.ivfthiscoaching.com to learn how to work together.